I'm Edward Pankov and I'm here with 365 NY Portal interviewing Julie Tulovsky who is the curator for... I'm curator for Russian and Soviet Nonconformist Art at the Zimmerle Art Museum at Rutgers University. This is an exhibition of Leonid Lam called Nevermore. And Leonid Lam is one of the um, most interesting and uh, versatile and diverse artists of the nonconformist movement. And in the Zimmerle, we have one of the largest in the world collection of uh, nonconformist art from the Soviet Union. What does it mean to be like a nonconformist? Well, as you know, that in the Soviet Union, there was only one style that officially was officially allowed, and that was socialist realism. Uh, the socialist realism was established in 1932 and continued until the downfall of the Soviet Union. Everything else uh, was non-conformist art. So anything that wasn't socialist realism? Anything that was not socialist realism was non-conformism. So we have an amazing collection of contemporary Russian art here at the Zimmerle in the heart of New Jersey. Was nonconformist art, if it's basically everything else, it must have branched out into all sorts of different styles. And I think, you know, we could see here by looking at his art that he himself, Lam, has explored a plethora of different styles. Absolutely. You know, you have two questions now. And yes, nonconformist art has a, a variety of style and mediums and techniques from metaphysical to conceptual to assemblages to kinetic art, everything that you can think of. We have here uh, over 20,000 pieces uh, by over 1,000 artists, and that also includes art not only from uh, Russian centers such as Moscow and in St. Petersburg or Leningrad back then, but majority of Soviet republics. Uh, so you name it, we, we have it. It's, an, it's really an encyclopedic collection. And as far as Leonid Lam's art is concerned, yes indeed, he was a very um, versatile artist uh, pursuing many different uh, approaches but as this exhibition shows, there was one main theme that goes throughout his art from the very beginning until the very end, and this is exploration of space. The constructivist I see from his early work, there's like some like influence of the constructivism, and then up until the 90s, I also see the, how this is actually also a very good historical collection, meaning like how, how the culture kind of changed, I think. Yes, absolutely. And uh, I think Lam is a very good example to trace how the time has changed. Uh, Lam um, had a quite unique opportunity to find out about the art of Russian avant-garde as early as 1940s. As you know, uh, art of Russian avant-garde was forbidden in the Soviet Union, and not that many people could actually see what the artists of the previous generations were doing, because it, it, this art was not exhibited in the museums, and it was not that easily available in books or anywhere else. So Lam was very uh, fortunate because he um, enrolled in the um, uh, Moscow Construc uh, Construction Institute, uh, and he was a student of Yakov, Ch Yakov Chernikov, who was a prominent avant-garde architect. And uh, he was also a, f a friend of the family, and it was through Chernikov that Lam got introduced to such key figures of Russian avant-garde as Vladimir Tatlin, for example, or architect Konstantin Melnikov, who lived in um, Moscow, in the center of Moscow, there is still the house of Konstantin Melnikov. And it was through these figures that Lam found out about Malevich, Matyushin, and uh, other um, prominent discoveries that were done in the 1910s and 1920s by their artists of the Russian art. So Malevich at the time of like the 40s and the 50s was considered to be outlawed? Malevich was not shown. All these paintings by Malevich were stored in the basements of the museum very far so the authorities would get to, to know about them and get to know that they are there and uh, practically the information was 
largely unavailable unless you were personally connected to someone who could introduce you to this information. Moreover, uh, this person had to really trust you in order to show this yes, information. Yes, it's like a it's like a secret club where these. I'm imagining if I'm not if I'm correct, like this secret club of architects and designers who are publicly working architects, designers, and illustrators, but secretly they are part of the Russian avant-garde. Is this correct? To imagine. Uh, this is correct to a point because um, you know club is something uh, kind of festive you know kind of a, you know maybe secret but uh, nevertheless uh, it's a kind of a more an entertainment there is an entertainment component in this world for those people it was uh, not really a club it was the um, scattered parts of the past that were forbidden and dangerous to expose because, you know, um, I don't want to scare you, but uh, in 1930s, in the end of 1930s, there were, you know, massive repressions and everybody who had the ability to think differently than the party demanded was in danger. Right. And therefore, um, um, you know, there was this um, not so much of a club, but individuals. Like uh, pockets. Like, like pockets, yes, who could introduce some of the younger generation to the previous culture. And it was like an important mission for each of these people. Yes, of course, of course. Uh, to carry and to, to translate uh, what they were about when they were younger to the next generation, to people who could actually, even in secret so far, carry it forward. And then, of course, it came out and had the results, the seeds uh, g gave great, uh, great results, great harvest. And of course, later in the 1960s and 70s, then there was more like of a secret club. And that was um, that atmosphere among the artists when there was a little bit of freer exchange, cultural exchange between the artists, they could um, gather more freely uh, in their kitchens and whatnot, then probably it was more like, like you described. So how would they store all this work, you know, if, if imagining a guy like Lamb, he's making... Well, the nonconformist movement actually initiated um, more or less after Stalin's death. Uh, Stalin died in 1953, and in 1956, on the 20th Congress of the Party, Nikita Khrushchev, who was Stalin's successor, made this secret speech about Stalin's crimes against people. And since then, since 1956, a period called the Thaw started in uh, uh, Soviet culture. And uh, after the Thaw, um, when the climate defrosted a little bit and more became possible and people were not uh, you know, put in jail in such quantities as they were during Stalin's time, this is when the nonconformist movement really took off and started to develop um, quite rapidly uh, because really this creative drive that people have in them, it's impossible to suppress. And I think this collection is the monument to this creative spirit. Yes, I definitely see, and I, I might be wrong with this, but like a strong element of satire in some of these works, like for example, uh, the one uh, the titled Venus. Yes. Which he's using everyday objects, you know, like, like found objects in order to kind of, I don't know, I might way of thinking, it sort of depicted an industrialized sexuality, which I found. Wow, I, I think it's a very good way to describe it, yes. Um, he, Lam was one of the first who started to do assemblages, or this, um, you know, reliefs from found objects. And um, some of his work, many of his work, uh, do have this uh, um, very, you know, strong uh, component of sexuality, although achieved in the, indeed in quite this, this industrial, this, this industrialized feeling. And also, like uh, talking about, um, there's that one interesting one that I still can't quite figure out: the Pentateuch. Oh yes, yes, that's. Um, a work that refers to the first five books of Bible 
And uh, in the 1970s, Lam uh, became interested in um, Kabbalah and in Jewish tradition. And he created a number of works that would refer to this tradition. And he also uh, wrote a treatise, uh, a text on a super signal that created and kind of governed the universe. So it's a, yes, so th this is a kind of a, you know, a force that, uh, a signal that you would get from the universe that would kind of dictate the sort of necessity um, of the creativity. And it's, so it's like a monism a, kind of. Yeah, yeah. Like this idea that within every point in the universe, an entire universe exists, and how every point is connected to every other point. And or, or there is certain kind of logos that shows you the way. And I think that uh, this um, idea of the super signal is reflected in the right. work. A lot of his work, like the Dada one, yeah. there's a very strong central point and a very strong emphasis on symmetry. Uh huh. Whereas I see also, like, as soon as the 1990s hit, his work had completely changed. I've noticed. What do you think of this? Well, I think. What I tried to show with this exhibition is Lam's, you know, distinct period and um, his approach to, uh, you know, his main approaches, uh, approach in within a particular period. For example, in his early um, years, in 1950s, he would take uh, Russian avant-garde themes like constructivist and suprematist motifs, but also insert third dimension to them and make them fly, because suprematist and constructivist were quite flat. Then with Dada and uh, you know, Da'ad, uh, he would take um, the letters and he uh, says, uh, said himself that this goes from um, poetry of Aberio, so it's from the avant-garde poetic group that he wanted to translate into the visual language. And he was one of the first who started to use letters uh, within the nonconformist movement, and uh, letters then became very prominent um, among the artists who practiced Sots art. And he was one of the first, he used them before Sots art, uh, following the avant-garde tradition. So uh, that was also about the space and how the space really... The convergent space. Right, and, and yes. draws the viewer in. So it was a new and different approach to space. See how this space, you know, the letters form a kind of a fence that really sucks the viewer in. You see the central point, like over here, the symmetry. Yes. <laughs> kind of a gates. So there could be multiple associations and really uh, it's an example opposite from the assemblages when it's you know the very graphic space that that really is very much depicted rather than physical it definitely says a lot it's very like obvious striking message and we can now move to the sphere which is the combination of the two And you said that this is, is what he himself considered to be his quintessential piece. Yes, exactly. Because um, he was, was working with the idea of space and of how to unite the space of the painting with the space of the viewer. And here he uses very different uh, methods uh, of painting construction. For example, there is a forward perspective that was uh, typical for classical painting and Renaissance painting. There is a re reverse perspective that actually makes the point of uh, a reference outside the painting in the viewer. And then there is the axonometry when the uh, same object is repeated several times. So the combination of all these devices really um, make an impression that the sphere is moving towards the viewer and uh, the viewer wants to a step out of its way. And it, uh, this, this way, this sphere that which is depicted almost physically exists in the space of the viewer, and therefore the, the boundaries between the depicted world and the physical world are destroyed. And therefore uh, the space becomes infinite, because there is this infinite 
space in the, of painting that is united with infinite space, physical space. So he was playing with the space throughout in the 1970s and 1990s and, and, and 1980s and 1990s. And so when he moved to America, he uh, started to play with cultural space and with the space of his uh, cultural space of his um, native country and how it combines with the new impressions that he got um, when he came to the United it States. It seems like, yeah, from that period of 1986 up until 1990, there was this huge like cut off and then a sudden like new transmission like a new signal that he kind of picked up right right because yeah was a, um, I you know I think he um, he was amazing in how well he could pick up things from from the surroundings and how masterfully he could combine them This is the work that is called Color in the Space, and you can see how it is protruding into the space of the viewer. So that's the idea of connecting the physical space and the pictorial space. Looks like a flower. It does look like a flower, yes. But also it does have this kind of industrial constructivist yes. and Dadaist right. aspect in it. So which, a bit absurd. Yeah, it is, and it also um, testifies about kind of synthetic um, nature of Lam's talent. Mm, yes, still even thinking about the constructivists a little bit, you know, how this idea yes. of we destroy everything and then put it back together the new way. And this is the Venus that we talked about and, uh, you know, this um, interesting way of really showing the sexuality um, for, with the found object. I think it's a quite difficult to do uh, because it's not really the idea of sexuality, the, the regular idea of sexuality, but I think here it really works. So it's quite amazing how... I just wonder how... How he managed to... Do. <laughs> the, the first, what's the first object you pick? Well, that I can't tell. <laughs> this is another work that um, touches upon Jewish theme. It's called Exodus. And he did it uh, right after he was released from the prison. Oh, he was in prison? He was in prison in 1973, after he applied for an exit visa to go to the United States. And then there was a provocation on the street. As he told me, he um, defended a girl that hooligans attacked in front of him. They all were taken into the militia. You know, the police, police station. station and the hooligans were released and he got three years in prison so um, that was really tough times but in prison he I think you know occupied his mind by thinking about the space and the, the shapes and how you know this pattern of tiles on the floor corresponds to the prison environment of the you know, prison grids, etc. And when he came out of the prison, he used these reflections to create um, artworks. product has its own code. Maybe it's an old one. Maybe it could be an old one, yeah. An imaginable one, so... But how would you imagine it? You know, it's like you have to... Well, be, you know. but it could be, you know, the, this rhythm of, of the stripes can be artistic. It doesn't necessarily have to be, you know, maybe he, as an artist, he thought that this would look better. Perhaps. So maybe he just copied a barcode from somewhere. Oh, maybe that. Or maybe there's a secret message in there. You never know. Well, that would be a great thing to find out. <laughs> Very exciting. This is the work um, 
that is uh, devoted to the Gulf War, and it quotes George W. Bush. Uh, there was a very famous phrase that he said, read my lips, and so Lam devoted the artwork to this phrase, event, uh, uh, situation with war, uh, and he also absorbed this, um, he, he has done it in the style of American pop art, uh, invading this cultural space and linking contemporary politics with uh, American most prominent style in art. So this collection was given to the museum by the collector Norton Dodge. Uh, Norton Dodge, yes? Yes, uh, that is an amazing story. Uh, Norton Dodge was an American professor of economics who went to uh, Soviet Union in the 1950s and then in the 1960s and uh, by chance got acquainted with nonconformist artist. Um, he got acquainted with someone who brought him to an apartment exhibition because the artist could not exhibit legally, so they exhibit in their private apartments and invited their friends and the friends of their friends through Gypsy Mail to come and see the art, or their art and the art of their friends. And this is how Norton Dodge um, became acquainted with and got into the circles and it soon became his mission to collect and preserve the forbidden art. And he collected, um, with the help of uh, other people, uh, over 20,000 pieces. And this is really the largest in the world in collection of uh, nonconformist art, which is absolutely encyclopedic. And he um, made considerable effort to promote this art in the United States of America. He talked to major museums such as Museum of Modern Art and he organized a large number of exhibitions and conferences devoted to this art. And finally in 1992 he donated this collection to Rutgers University and to the Zimmerle Art Museum uh, to make a permanent home for it. And we uh, do exhibitions on a regular basis and we have a permanent galleries where the history of the movement uh, can be seen at any time. So when did, when did Lam begin to start making video art? These uh, videos are from 2006 and they are done uh, in collaboration with his wife, Inessa Levkova Lam. There are three videos, one of them is called Crusader and it comprises, um, it is devoted to the campaign in Iraq and it comprises Lam's um, early motifs of his early works with some military topics. The other one is called uh, Wheel of Fortune and uh, um, it is this moving circle which shows you the hi historic images the works of art, etc., throughout the uh, 20th century, uh, the history throughout the 20th century, and it is done uh, with Carmina Burana music. And this video is called Nevermore, and uh, the exhibition title is related to this video. And it starts with an old woman and a raven, and this uh, Edgar Allan Poe. It is referred to Edgar Allan Poe, uh, and it's never more uh, on one, uh, it's, it's a kind of um, a revisiting and uh, not quite rejecting, but, but kind of commemorating the, the past and the, uh, the different periods of life and art that you go through. And then we have another video installation in the exhibition on the opposite wall that was uh, done in collaboration uh, with uh, uh, Leonid Lam's daughter, Olga Lam, who is a graphic designer. And uh, it is called Thought, Thoughts, Patterns and Reflection. Uh, and it comprises the um, screen with uh, nine images uh, of clouds with superimposed text by Olga Lam and uh, images by Leonid 
that again uh, are collages of depicted space, uh, real photogra photographs of real space, and then the digital space. And they have um, these images, they have this robot-like figures uh, that uh, are kind of intruders into the real space from the digital space, and it's really the, the connection in between um, all these possible, um, uh, you know, spaces of uh, existence of human spirit. It's like this idea of uh, pixelated thought. Yes, yes. Of the real space that becomes pixelated, or that pixels intruding in the real space, etc. We didn't really cover what he did too much in the new millennium, though. Yes, uh, he had an amazingly long and uh, amazingly fruitful career. And uh, he had a chance to explore into the digital space. As I said, his entire life was devoted to the exploration of space. And of course, as opportunities of uh, new opportunities of digital space couldn't, uh, uh, couldn't escape him. So uh, in one of his work, in one of his serious reincarnations, he took his old designs from 1950s and then he thought of how the same designs would need to be changed in order to match the energy of the 1990s and 2000s. And um, behind us there is the work that reflects how, how the dynamics of the time would change. So uh, this exhibition starts with uh, works in the 1950s and ends with the pieces uh, that includes works from the 1950s and with the reference to contemporary times. It becomes like, even more metaphysical at that point. Right. That's so, like a meta statement. So it makes the, the full the circle, circle yeah. throughout his 70 year long career. Because this exhibition was aimed at his 19th birthday and had to celebrate his 19th birthday. Unfortunately, it didn't happen, but nevertheless, it celebrates an amazing career of an amazing artist. And I would invite anyone and everyone to come to the Zimmerle Art Museum at Rutgers University in New Brunswick and uh, check out this uh, exhibition and uh, as well as other galleries. We have a, a permanent collection uh, with nonconformist artists uh, on view, as well as many other interesting parts, French art, American art, and many uh, exciting events. Please come.